Good afternoon. My name is Tim Ho. I'm Director of Telehealth with the UNC Cancer Network. Thank you so much for being here today, September 25th, 2019, for our Medical and Surgical Oncology Lecture. We really appreciate having you here. A uh, few things I want to go over, then we'll meet our guest and get started with our talk for today. Uh, let's see, if you are having any technical difficulties at all, now is the time to let us know. Don't wait until uh, you've missed part of the lecture. You can go ahead and call us, 919-445-1000. You can email us, unccn at unc.edu. Let us know if anything is not working as you think it should be so that you can hear this lecture. Of course, each and every one of our lectures is recorded goes into our uh, learning portal as well as our video library. So if you have a colleague, friend who you would like to make sure uh, sees this lecture, here's this lecture, it will be available there as well. Uh, you can find our learning portal, learn.unccn.org, and our main website, unccn.org. Lots of information, including Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, uh, and other places to find out about us as well. I uh, just want to emphasize that all of our, uh, this and every one of our lectures is free, uh, unccn.org, you can find out about our upcoming lectures, uh, learn.unccn.org, you can find out about our recorded lectures in our learning portal, uh, all of them are available for credit for one year after the actual lecture date. All right, and uh, with that in mind, let's talk about Poll Everywhere. We will be using Poll Everywhere today. We hope that you will use Poll Everywhere. This makes the lecture more engaging. It's completely anonymous, gives you a chance to uh, answer questions that Dr. Jensen is going to ask you, and then at the end, you'll be able to ask Dr. Jensen questions in turn. Easy way to connect, go to pollev, P-O-L-L-E-V, dot C-O-M forward slash U-N-C-C-N. You can do this on any web browser, including on a smartphone or tablet. Um, once you're connected, uh, you'll see the questions as they appear here in the studio. Go ahead and answer those at the end. You'll be able to type in your questions. If you prefer to use a phone uh, without a browser, you can go ahead and in the texting, type in the two field, 22333. In the message field, UNCCN, you'll get a message back that says you've joined and then you're in for the rest of, the, uh, of, of this afternoon's lecture. You'll be able to uh, respond to the questions and then ask your own questions at the end. Uh, we're not quite live with the poll lab question yet, but this is the question. Cardio-oncology is a growing multidisciplinary field concerned with understanding and managing disease in patients who have been or soon will be treated for cancer. And that blank, if you think it's uh, stomach, would be A, lung B, heart C, or liver D. And we'll put up the actual poll in just a moment. All right, so without further ado... We want to meet our guest, Dr. Jensen. Dr. Jensen, thank you so much for being My here pleasure. today. Uh, so let's see, what do we know about you? Associate Professor of Medicine and Pharmacology at the University of, University of North Carolina School of Medicine. So That's far right. so good? That's right. All right. Uh, physician scientist with clinical and investigative focus on heart failure. Yep. Uh, clinical certification in advanced heart, trans heart failure transplantation. Spends three months of the year as an attending physician on the UNC Heart Failure Transplant LVAD Inpatient Service. That's correct. Great. And you direct UNC Cardio Oncology Clinic. Uh, let's see, what else? And projects include a laboratory focus on identifying the mechanisms underlying cardiotoxicity of cytotoxic and targeted cancer therapies. That's right. Great. What's one thing we should know that wasn't on, our, on your CV there? I'm among the very few folks around here who actually grew up in Chapel Hill. Oh, so great. I'm a Chapel Hill native. All right. I'm really happy to be back here for the past 10 years with my wife, who's an OBGYN on faculty here at our Great. Decades. Great. All right. Well, good to know. Well, let's see how they did with this poll. We'll put that up. Uh, again, cardio-oncology is a growing multidisciplinary field concerned with understanding and managing blank disease in patients who have been or soon will be treated for cancer. And uh, honestly, we think this is a bit of a softball, uh, as they usually are. This is just to make sure that, that everyone out there understands how to use poll everywhere. Uh, a was stomach, B lung, C heart, D liver. Uh, looks like uh, we're seeing a pretty strong well. showing yeah. on heart there. Okay, great. So we'll, we'll uh, glad, glad you all are hooked into Poll Everywhere. Again, it's anonymous, uh, so we hope you'll use that for the questions that come up for the rest of the lecture. 
This activity has been planned and implemented under the sole supervision of the course directors in association with the UNC Office of Continuing Professional Development. Dr. Thomas Shea consults for Spectrum Pharma and receives research support from Millennium, Atsuka, GSK, BMS, Novartis, and Seattle Genetics. Dr. James Coghill, MD and CPD staff have no relevant financial relationships with the commercial interests as defined by the ACCME. Brian Caldwell Jensen, MD, has no financial relationships with commercial interests. And with that said, cardiovascular toxicity of targeted cancer therapies, clinical considerations, and potential mechanisms. Let me turn the keyboard and mouse over to you. Very good. Well, um, thanks, Tim. Um, you know, it, it has been, for the past four years, it's been a real pleasure for me to be a part of the Cancer Center community here. Um, certainly an honor to speak to the Cancer Network today as well, and I hope that these comments are of use uh, clinically and perhaps a little bit provocative um, from a scientific standpoint as well. So, as Tim said, I, I have directed the cardio-oncology clinic here for about four years or so, and I'll offer a few thoughts on uh, what cardio-oncology might be uh, to start this talk. Uh, I also am a basic scientist, and my lab, among other things, is very interested in understanding the mechanisms that underlie the cardiotoxicity or cardiovascular toxicity of some of the new or relatively new targeted therapies. And so we're going to explore some of those potential mechanisms with a brief introduction to some of the work that we've done through the course of this talk. So the, the fundamental question at hand is, why are some targeted cancer therapies associated with cardiotoxicity? I spoke in this forum about two years ago uh, with an earlier introduction to cardio-oncology and really focused on longer standing therapies, anthracyclines and radiation therapy. Uh, there have been tremendous advances, it goes without saying, in cancer therapeutics in, in recent years. Um, among those advances have been greater selectivity of targeting, uh, molecular targeting, Along with that greater selectivity has come decreased uh, multi-organ toxicities. And I think there was justifiable hope that cardiotoxicity itself could be eliminated altogether by thoughtful drug design and targeting. There have been great strides made, um, but still some of the agents that we use today are plagued by cardiovascular toxicities, and we're going to discuss some of those today. So. Um, slightly out of order here, I admit we're first going to consider kinase inhibitors and, and look at some work that I've done in my lab, um, collaboration with Gary Johnson in particular here in our Department of Pharmacology. Talk then about uh, HER2 antagonists, chiefly trastuzumab or Herceptin, uh, and then close with consideration of checkpoint inhibitors. First though, just a, a brief introduction for those who are less familiar with cardio-oncology. It is not, uh, as its name might suggest, a study of atrial myxomas. It is rather a growing multidisciplinary field concerned with understanding and managing heart disease in patients who have been or soon will be treated for cancer. And to elaborate a bit upon that, I think the, the overarching goal of cardio-oncology is perhaps to raise awareness of some potential cardiovascular toxicities associated with cancer therapies, but much more importantly to mitigate and treat and identify those toxicities in order to enhance, you know, optimal treatment for cancer therapy for cancer patients, and that's that's the goal here. With that in mind, who who could be a cardio oncologist? I think this is, as the definition suggests, a multidisciplinary field. Certainly, many of us are cardiologists, but there's no reason that medical oncology providers or surgical oncology providers, radiation oncology providers, maybe even basic scientists could participate, most broadly speaking, in the field of cardio-oncology. So why cardio-oncology? This is a relatively new field. Uh, why, why this interest? Um, and I think this is a slide that, that is representative of one tumor type, uh, breast cancer. Um, large uh, study from the SEER Medicare database of over 60,000 women. Um, interestingly, for me and for others who see this slide for the first time, the cause of death in breast cancer patients, all, all except for those who are diagnosed with late stage breast cancer, the most common cause of death is actually cardiovascular disease rather than breast cancer. And of the women who died of cardiovascular disease in this 
database. Only a quarter of them had uh, a cardiovascular disease diagnosis at the time of enrollment. So who are cardio-oncology patients? And this is uh, as in part a way to introduce you to the patients whom I see in my clinic, but also a way to frame the considerations for today's talk. And so um, in recognition of the fact that there are shared risk factors for heart disease and some types of cancer, uh, one type of cardio-oncology patient is the patient who has comorbid heart disease and cancer, so a smoker who has a history of coronary artery disease is diagnosed with lung cancer. We're going to spend most time today considering what I've caused, called a causal uh, relationship between cancer and heart disease. And the two examples here are people whom I've seen in clinic, a woman with a history of uh, non-Hodgkin lymphoma who got CHOP and presents with heart failure and a low ejection fraction or a 63-year-old woman who had ovarian cancer, treated with Avastin and presented with uh, refractory high blood pressure. Lastly, in the largest group would be the survivorship group, a woman who has a distant history of breast cancer now presents with atrial fibrillation. And I think that there's reason to pause and point out the fact that the number of people in each of these groups is likely to rise, but most prominently in the survivorship group, and that's in large part a recognition of the fact that there have been such tremendous advances in the treatment of cancer. More people are surviving cancer, and hence more people are um, going to develop cardiovascular disease. As a way to illustrate the potential for the increase in survivorship, um, these are most recent numbers from the CDC showing that, again, um, to our dismay as cardiologists and cancer providers, heart disease and cancer continue to be by far the leading causes of death in the United States. This is true um, across genders, and this is a, a younger age group. I want to point out that um, women over 64, and particularly women into their 70s, uh, have nearly the same rate of death from heart disease as men do. So. These, these are statistics, and um, the reasons that underlie these statistics are probably complicated and multifold, but it is true that survivors of cancer have increased risk for different types of cardiovascular disease, atherosclerosis, heart failure, pericardial disease, and valvular heart disease. And I think acknowledging these statistics to be relatively accurate, albeit a, a bit dated, um, the question then becomes, does the increased risk for cardiovascular disease arise from shared risk factors, such as smoking, as we introduced in the previous slide, um, or is there something about the biology of cancer or some types of cancer that changes the cardiovascular biology, um, or is there something about the treatment of cancer that increases the risk for subsequent cardiovascular disease? And I think we'll spend the most time today focusing on the, the last possibility and indeed what we could do to mitigate whatever risk might be incurred um, by virtue of, of cancer treatment. So um, this brings us to our first uh, Poll Everywhere question, um, a bit of a chip shot perhaps. Which of the following statements about cardio-oncology is true? Cardio-oncology is a growing multidisciplinary field concerned with managing lung disease in cancer patients. Cancer patients with cardiovascular disease are likely to die from chronic respiratory diseases. The two leading causes of death are cancer and diabetes. And cancer is associated with an increased risk of subsequent cardiovascular disease. And I, I think it's entirely possible that we had a couple of uh, answers bleed through from the last poll question there. And that, that, that would be my inclination based on how we've seen things change in the last few seconds here. The group's doing well. Good. All right. So sounds like uh, those folks with the D got it? That's right. All right. And That's anything right. you want to elaborate on that answer at all? No, just wanted to get people warmed up. Great. Great. Okay. Sounds good. So the, the question will offer this the opportunity to pivot away from thinking about cardio-oncology more broadly and to begin to think a little bit about why targeted therapies might cause cardiovascular toxicity. Um, this consideration offers me an opportunity to discuss a really fun collaboration that I uh, undertook with some folks at the Cancer Center here recently led by Josh Zeidner, um, whom I told was a hip-hop artist. 
in a previous life. Um, we recently um, published a, what I thought was a, a fun and, and somewhat thought-provoking editorial in JCO um, challenging current practices, regulatory practices around the monitoring of QT intervals uh, in the administration of cancer drugs, both clinically and, and in the setting of clinical trials. Um, as somebody who thinks about mechanisms underlying targeted therapies, um, I think it's important to acknowledge that a lot of the preclinical testing has focused largely on the potential for uh, proarrhythmic effects in, in drugs in development um, or early phase clinical trials. And um, we do know, and I don't want to, to um, diminish the importance of prolonging the QT. Um, if it becomes pathological and profound, it can predispose to life-threatening ventricular arrhythmias. Um, however, two things. One, I think as we as Josh rightly pointed out in this editorial, we need to be thoughtful about the way we measure the QT and how we use the QT measurements to adjudicate treatment. And secondly, from a mechanistic standpoint, from my point of view, the um, preclinical in vitro testing that's done to look for effects that might on the HERC channel or the, um, that might lead to QT prolongation um, is uh, insufficient, honestly, to, to profile risk for novel therapies. And I'll, I'll unpack that statement a little bit here. Um, there, I think, is broader recognition of this fact as, as well. Um, and the, the safety pharmacology folks and their International Council for Harmonization statement have indicated that it's important to look for the potential for ventricular arrhythmias, but also acknowledge that targeted therapies can cause other problems, high blood pressure, um, heart failure, and that we, we need to be more thoughtful about the way that we routinely screen for these toxicities. As I introduce you to some of our work, I'm going to offer some other thoughts about how we might begin to, to characterize um, compounds that might have a higher potential for cardiotoxicity. Um, first, though, just a brief detour into why why, why it should be possible, why it should be eminently possible to design drugs that are effective at treating cancer but not toxic to the cardiomyocyte. And here I'm going to focus largely on heart muscle cells. So heart muscle cells are very different from cancer cells. Heart muscle cells are terminally differentiated. Cancer cells are inherently undifferentiated. Cardiomyocytes have very limited capacity for regeneration, whereas cancer cells unchecked have nearly limitless uh, capacity for replication. And I'm going to focus a bit on metabolism later because I, I think this is an important distinction between normal cardiomyocytes, which derive their acid, their, excuse me, their energy largely from fatty acids, um, as contrasted with cancer cells that use glucose and glutamine as substrates instead. In any event, these differences do suggest that we should be able to develop drugs that are safe um, for the heart in treating cancer. In contrast to the normal cardiomyocytes that I talked about before, I do want to mention mostly as a thought exercise here that the, the failing heart begins to develop some um, cellular and molecular similarities to cancer that, that are of real interest to me at least. Um, when uh, cardiomyocytes are injured, they largely undergo hypertrophy, whereas cancer cells typically undergo hyperplasia. The response to injury in the heart includes vascular rarefaction or the reduction in the density of vasculature, whereas angiogenesis is characteristic of many tumor types. There are some similarities of interest between heart failure and cancer, and here again I, I want to emphasize the uh, metabolic similarities as a way to perhaps ex explain why people who have pre-existing heart injury are at, probably at a greater likelihood of developing cardiotoxicity in, in response to targeted therapies. And that's largely because injured cardiomyocytes have already engaged these uh, pathways, and these are pathways that might be preferentially targeted by the kinase inhibitors in particular that we use. So as a way to begin talking about kinase inhibitors, um, the signaling pathways in the heart are complex as they are in cancer. Um, there are some pathways that are cardioprotective in the heart just as they are oncogenic, 
Um, and so targeting oncogenic pathways that are cardioprotective in the heart might predictably cause some heart injury. Uh, but there are also some important molecular dissimilarities between signaling pathways, in, in particularly in the normal heart and in, in cancer. Um, can we use the, our understanding of signaling pathways and the molecular biology in the heart and cancer to predict uh, the potential cardiotoxicity of targeted therapy? Not so well as it turns out. You know, there are some agents like Herceptin, which we'll talk about in a bit, where the target in the heart is indeed cardioprotective and it does induce heart failure. There are other good examples of that. In contrast, the EGFR um, target of erlotinib is, has cardioprotective roles in the heart but has no meaningful cardiotoxicity clinically. Then we go down to, to me, really interesting examples like ibrutinib where the target of ibrutinib, uh, brutin tyrosine kinase, has no recognized role in the heart whatsoever. But as many of you know, ibrutinib causes uh, particularly atrial arrhythmias and occasionally some ventricular arrhythmias as well. So, no, we're not particularly good at, at predicting, um, based purely on our understanding of biology, which drugs are going to be cardiotoxic. So first to talk about kinase inhibitors. And kinase inhibitors um, generally don't kill cardiomyocytes. These are not cytotoxic therapies in the heart. Um, so how do they lead to heart failure? Um, and you can understand from my statement that they do. Um, this is a, a five-year-old, six-year-old slide that looks at the use of kinase inhibitors for the treatment of renal cell cancer. And I, I'm, I emphasize here heart failure at the bottom, uh, but I do want to call to your attention the relatively high incidence of hypertension in these patients. And indeed, there's a, there's a really interesting and slightly disturbing as a cardiologist literature that shows that the more hypertensive the recipient of these drugs is, the more likely the treatment is to be efficacious uh, for renal cell cancer. In any event, I'm not going to say more about hypertension here, and I don't have a slide on this, but one of my friends in the cardio-oncology community is about to publish a study showing greater efficacy for the use of calcium channel blockers in the treatment of kinase inhibitor-induced uh, hypertension, I think particularly in renal cell cancer patients. And so um, heads up for that paper and just a word that, that you may find calcium channel blockers more effective in treating hypertension in this context than other agents. Um, particularly, and I won't spend much time on this, but um, I think a good illustration of relatively predictable on-target cardiovascular toxicity is indeed the hypertension that arises from uh, inhibition of the VEGF signaling pathway, where uh, VEGF's purpose in the vasculature, is, among its purposes in the vasculature, is to facilitate generation of nitric oxide, which is a vasodilatory and most potent endogenous vasodilator, and, and so predictably reducing the bioavailability of nitric oxide or the, by the generation of nitric oxide will lead to increased vascular tone. So this is, a, this is an example of predictable uh, vascular toxicity. I also want to point out that when we consider the cardiovascular toxicity of some of these agents, it's worth considering that there can be direct toxicity, and this is on target both uh, molecularly and physiologically, if you will, that, that, um, that VEGF pathway inhibitors cause hypertension. Um, they also can cause heart failure, and that heart failure is multifactorial. It's due in part to the increased load on the heart that's engendered by the high blood pressure, and in part due to the fact that some of the targets of these drugs are also cardioprotective in the heart, and here I offer PGFR as, a, as an example. So that brings us to our next question. Tim, should I read the answers or let people uh, read them if, if you would, the, sure. the text is a little small here, so sure. if you don't mind, that would be great. Sure. So which of the following statements about kinase inhibitors is true? A, Herg channel testing predicts heart failure. B, heart failure and cancer both share the biology of cellular hypertrophy and angiogenesis. C, kinase inhibitors can lead to heart failure. Or D, kinase inhibitors do not cause hypertension because they are highly selective for cancer cells. All right, good. We're getting some differences of opinion here. Yeah, this is good. It's always great. 
And if you'll take about 10 more seconds to, to go ahead and weigh in on this question, please. All right. Well, definitely more variety in terms of the answers. Uh, yeah. So the, the correct answer here is, is C. Mm -hmm. um, and the, the reason that, that B is not wholly accurate is that cellular hypertrophy is generally not a characteristic of cancer cells. Cancer cells typically, cancer expands through hyperplasia more so, more so, so than through, through hypertrophy, whereas cardiomyocytes can grow in size, i.e. hypertrophy, but really can't multiply in any meaningful way. Um, and so that, that's the, the reason that that was not the correct answer, but that one was certainly a little trickier than the last one. All right, great. And thanks to all of you for, uh, for, for answering that. So now let's detour a bit into our, the work that we've done in our lab. Um, so the first question that we asked was, can we use mice to accurately model human kinase inhibitor cardiotoxicity? And I think this is always a central question, in, particularly in small animal research. Um, so we chose three different kinase inhibitors for this study. We chose two that had uh, manifest recognized cardiovascular toxicity in sinitinib and serafinib. And we also chose erlotinib, which has no meaningful uh, cardiac toxicity in humans. And we subjected mice to two weeks of these drugs, and we did echocardiography at baseline at day 7 and day 14. Um, and at least with these drugs in these mice, our findings did seem to mirror human findings. Um, more mice with sunitinib and serafinib than the vehicle treated uh, or placebo treated, if you will, mice uh, had a drop in the contractile function of their heart than did erlotinib treated mice. This is work that was done in a really fun ongoing collaboration with Gary Johnson, uh, the recent uh, somewhat retired chair of pharmacology here, uh, who's been a wonderful collaborator and mentor for me. Um, don't expect anyone to be able to read these figures here. Just wanted to point out one thing that was interesting to me, and that's that, that Gary had this really fantastic publication in Cell a number of years ago that described the reprogramming in, in tumors using triple negative breast cancer as an example here, where the, the, two, the kinase landscape in, in uh, breast cancer was fascinating, showed a lot of upregulation of kinases that weren't obviously associated with the target kinases. We saw the same thing here. And to my great surprise, when you subject hearts in vivo to these drugs, you see more upregulation of kinases than you do see down than you see down regulation of kinases. Again, using a an antagonist or inhibitor drug, this strikes me as a little bit surprising and interesting. So we chose rather than to try to understand the cardiotoxicity of sunitinib and serafinib, we chose instead to ask why erlotinib, which targets an ostensibly cardioprotective uh, receptor in EGFR, why isn't erlotinib cardiotoxic? And we used Gary's uh, proteomics platform, this kinome profiling platform that he developed, um, to ask that question. Um, one thing that we found that was interesting, a signal that was consistent in, in the proteomics and the RNA or transcriptomics studies that we did, um, with, was that the JAK-STAT3 pathway was upregulated after treatment with erlotinib. And this was in contrast to sunitinib and serafinib, where JAK-STAT was, was downregulated routinely. Um, we used Western blotting to, to confirm that finding, where there's a clear upregulation of, of STAT3 when compared to uh, any of the other three groups. So why might this be interesting? Um, first of all, it's interesting to me because one of the fundamental questions that we're asking, whether it was clearly stated or not, is to what extent does the heart respond like cancer when confronted with these kinase inhibitor drugs? And so the upregulation of JAK-STAT pathways uh, has been clearly demonstrated in multiple different tumor types here. Um, and indeed, there are uh, on their drug development efforts and combination therapy efforts underway already to target this escape, this JAK-STAT escape to EGFR 
uh, inhibition, such that combination EGFR inhibitor, STAT inhibitor um, approaches are under active consideration. This might also be viewed as an escape pathway in the heart as well, where activation of STAT3 is cardioprotective, and we considered whether um, it, this might be the case, that, he, that erlotinib might not be cardiotoxic, in part because it upregulates STAT3 as a, uh, an escape or protection mechanism. And so to test that hypothesis, we treated mice with a combination of EGFR inhibitor and STAT inhibitor. And indeed, whereas neither the STAT inhibitor nor the EGFR inhibitor alone caused heart failure in the mice, the combination of the two did. And looking into why that might be, it became, um, it was interesting to us that um, fatty acid oxidation, you may remember that I introduced the concept that fatty acids are the key substrate for energy generation in cardiomyocytes. Both of these cardiotoxic agents embarrass fatty acid oxidation in, in primary cardiomyocytes or heart muscle cells, whereas erlotinib increases it. But when you add a STAT inhibitor to erlotinib, um, you find, in fact, that that increase is blunted and that the combination reduces fatty acid oxidation. And so one of the hypotheses from these findings was that, um, A, uh, targeting cardiomyocyte metabolism might contribute to, to cardiac toxicity of kinase inhibitors, and B, we should be a little bit careful before um, we fully implement combination kinase inhibitor therapies. The next example I'm going to use when considering kinase inhibitor cardiotoxicity is unpublished. The previous results were published uh, two years ago. Um, this is an ongoing study looking at trametinib, which is an inhibitor of the uh, ras raf uh, signaling pathway. Trametinib is a highly selective inhibitor of, of MEK-1-2. Uh, and um, as predicted, when we administered trametinib to mice in vivo, ERK, which is the sole downstream target of, of MEK, uh, ERK activation is completely blocked. Um, so we asked, and I should say those many of you are probably well aware that trametinib is used most commonly in uh, melanoma, uh, but also approved for small cell lung cancer, excuse me, non small cell lung cancer, and is, is in active investigation in breast cancer and other tumor types. Um, Trametinib causes a reversible decrease in the contractile function of the heart by echocardiography. We use fractional shortening in mice rather than ejection fraction, but it's a comparable concept. And we find that lung weight increases in these mice. This is a, a measure of pulmonary edema and very consistent with the finding that these mice do indeed develop uh, heart failure. Um, and our numbers have increased substantially here. We have about 20 mice in each group now. We used Gary's uh, proteomics platform, the kinome profiling platform, to first confirm that the trametinib did target MEK1 and 2, and this was a nice validation for us, and then to explore the rest of the kinome's response to trametinib. And similar to the other agents, we found uh, more upregulation of pathways than downregulation, though the pathways that were the kinases that were more that were preferentially downregulated were in the metabolic group, and we have some functional data to support these findings as well. We also used RNA seq to profile the transcriptome of the heart, and here found again a, a dramatic effect on uh, pathways involved in mitochondrial function and fatty acid oxidation. These are fold enrichments of five and p-values in the minus thirty to minus forty range, um, and so that similarly supported the, the thought that trametinib might injure the heart by decreasing um, cardiac metabolism. Indeed, we found less ATP in the trametinib-treated hearts. We found fewer mitochondria in the trametinib-treated hearts. And when we used in vitro studies, using again uh, primary cardiomyocytes, we find that there's not much in the way of cell death. This is doxorubicin, uh, which increases cell death about five-fold in this LDH release assay. Trametinib, even at the higher concentrations, doesn't do that. It does, on the other hand, significantly reduce the number of functional mitochondria. This is citrate synthase, which is an assay that's used to um, determine mitochondrial function. 
This is oxidative phosphorylation using a, an apparatus called the Seahorse Bioanalyzer, uh, where trametinib has a dose-dependent effect on oxidative phosphorylation and similarly reduces fatty acid oxidation uh, in vitro as well. There's a concomitant decrease in mitochondrial membrane potential and increase in reactive oxygen species generation. And so collectively, we took these data to be relatively convincing evidence that trametinib um, decreases mitochondrial function in cardiomyocytes, and that probably contributes to the decreased ATP concentration in the trametinib-treated mouse hearts. This is interesting because this is not a recognized function of the MECRC pathway in cardiomyocytes, and, and we're very interested in pursuing this observation further. So, step back. I really should have said, and I apologize that I did not up front, um, trametinib causes um, cardiac toxicity in the form of either cardiomyopathy or fully symptomatic heart failure in between 5 and 10 percent of patients. So this is still, this is the minority of patients. It is almost entirely reversible in humans. Um, so I don't in any way mean to suggest that these data should, should dampen enthusiasm for its use clinically. I want to pivot away from, from our mechanistic work, and that's the last of my science that I'm going to subject you to. Um, I want to go back and, and talk about the targeted therapy that really engaged my interest and many people's interest in this field to start with, and that's trastuzumab, which, uh, again, as many if not all of you know, is an absolute blockbuster drug. Um, what was interesting to me is that the preclinical testing that was done, and again, this was 20 years ago or so, uh, didn't really predict any cardiac toxicity in, in uh, associated with trastuzumab. Um, and some of the early clinical trials didn't, didn't show as much either, but, but our real-world experience um, shows that, in, in fact, um, quite a few women who receive trastuzumab or pertuzumab or the HP combination that's being used more commonly now uh, do actually develop a decline in their ejection fraction. Thankfully, it's usually relatively mild, it's usually asymptomatic, and it's almost always, not always, almost always reversible. I'm going to skip the mechanism here, uh, except to say the, probably the reason that the cardiotoxicity was not prevented, was not predicted preclinically, was A, that that was back in the era of really focusing just on herd testing. Um, and B, that it's a really, it involves a really fascinating interaction between endothelial cells and cardiomyocytes that would be difficult to tease out um, with sort of protocolized uh, preclinical testing. So what do we do about it? And, and this remains an active question. This is uh, guidelines that were, are now seven years old, and these are um, not evidence-based. These are expert consensus. Um, this is really difficult to read, and I apologize for that, but I want to focus on this group here, which is to say, what, you know, what do we do when women who are receiving her two antagonists drop their ejection fraction? Here the um, authors are suggesting that you continue the drug provided that the ejection fraction is greater than 40 percent. I think, you know, I and, and most of the oncologists with whom I work feel nervous using 40 percent as a cutoff. 45 percent feels a, a bit um, more conservative and, and realistic, um, but that I think that a drop in ejection fraction should prompt, and there are some data, not great or overwhelming data, but there are some data that certainly support the use of neurohormonal antagonists like uh, beta blockers or ACE inhibitors once the ejection fraction does drop, and so I think a reasonable practice here would be if the ejection fraction drops 10 percent or more, or if the absolute ejection fraction is 45% or less, that it's reasonable to pause therapy, reasonable to initiate neuromonal antagonist therapy with lisinopril or carvedilol, the most commonly used agents. Um, Re-image within a month or so, and if the ejection fraction has recovered, then to resume therapy. That's been our standard approach here, and I think a, a more standard approach that's been used nationally as well. Excuse me. Don't want to go all Marco Rubio on you. Um, so this is a slide I think that I poached from High Mus. Um, th there are issues with monitoring in trastuzumab, where um, more testing doesn't necessarily lead to better care. And I'm certainly not advocating uh, that we 
do echocardiograms, you know, every every other or every six weeks or after every three week treatment cycle. Um, and, and so I, I think it's a, a sensible approach to monitoring, um, early monitoring for higher risk patients, less frequent monitoring for lower risk patients, um, seems to be a judicious approach to um, HER2 antagonist therapy. And I am more than happy to, to put a finer point on that during questions. So there have been a number of studies looking at primary prevention of HER2 antagonist cardiomyopathy. And I'm going to go through these briefly um, because the conclusion is clearly unclear. Um, so Prada and Manticore, um, Prada used candesartan, the angiotensin receptor blocker, and metoprolol and showed that there was probably a modestly protective effect to using candesartan as a primary prevention strategy. Manticore showed just the opposite. There was probably a mild protective effect to using the beta blocker bisoprolol for primary prevention. These are both small studies. Larger study that was just published um, looks at primary prevention using lisinopril or carvedilol in trastuzumab treated um, women. Um, and two subgroups here, those who received anthracyclines and those who did not. Um, a couple of things to point out. Uh, the, the incidence of decrease in ejection fraction is higher than has been identified in certainly any of the randomized control trials and even in many of the real world publications. Here we're talking about 30 percent of women who receive trastuzumab experience some decrease in their ejection fraction. Short story, in those who do not receive anthracyclines, there's no benefit to using either strategy up front for primary prevention in those who do receive anthracyclines, there's a slightly lower incidence of uh, cardiotoxicity, um, but the difference is small and the absolute difference in ejection fraction is relatively small as well. As well. There was just a meta-analysis published on this topic, hot off the press is not in the slides, I'm sorry. The take-home message from the meta-analysis was that using primary prevention strategy probably gets you about 2% ejection fraction improvement or protection, if you will, um, but there's real question as to whether or not that's clinically meaningful. So jury is still out on primary prevention. Last class of drugs I want to talk about are immune checkpoint inhibitors. Um, so again, as, as you are all well aware, um, broadly used now, will be more broadly used in the future, highly effective in multiple different tumor types. Um, the idea is to uh, remove a couple of molecular restraints on T cell proliferation in a way that can have anti-tumor efficacy to, to unleash the T cells, the anti-tumor anti -tumor effects of T cells in particular on cancer. There are a number of different um, immune cell mediated toxicities associated with checkpoint inhibitors, um, pneumonitis, dermatitis, gastroenteritis. Um, most of those, as I'm going to show you in a minute, are, are more common than the myocarditis that is also associated with immune checkpoint inhibitors. But I, I do want to take the time to call your attention to this problem because it is you know, thankfully a low frequency problem, but it can be quite serious. So um, the same uh, molecular pathways that allow, that remove the restraint on T cell uh, proliferation and, and release T cells into tumors um, can also, in some people, and it's not really understood why this occurs in some people and not others, um, cause unrestrained clonal proliferation of T cells, predominantly T cells. Um, in the myocardium as well, and that is what we call, broadly speaking, myocarditis. So the first uh, high-profile publication of this problem was in the New England Journal uh, by Javed Moslehi and others, and this is you know, almost three years ago in 2016. Uh, this is a 65-year-old woman who's receiving a dual checkpoint inhibitor therapy, um, but has no other cardiac risk factors and presents with chest pain and fatigue has markedly elevated cardiac biomarkers. Her initial EKG was relatively unconcerning, showed a nonspecific interventricular conduction delay, and her initial echocardiogram showed a normal ejection fraction. 
So she was diagnosed with myocarditis. She was treated with high dose, high dose uh, solumedrol, and in relatively short order developed complete heart block, degenerating into ventricular arrhythmias and death. Um, the mechanism of her death, and, and they showed um, some postmortem samples of, of her heart, uh, was indeed myocarditis. Uh, this is culled from a, a different paper, a review from cardiovascular research recently that was quite good, um, showing dense staining for both T-cells and monocyte macrophages with CD3 and CD68. These same um, infiltrative patterns can be seen in skeletal muscle um, and certainly in tumors as well. Um, this is a slide. I've never seen figures like the data displayed quite like this, but I, I find it really um, illustrative of some facts. So I told you earlier that, that gastroenteritis, pneumonitis um, are more common adverse effects, and here we see the numbers of these adverse effects on the left. And we look at case fatality rates on the right, which are not trivial for any of them, but certainly lower than myocarditis, where the case fatality rate approaches 40%. Now the incidence, thankfully, is still probably lower than 1%. There, as, as there are more efforts at detection made, I think we are finding more cases of low-level troponin release that is not associated with clinically or hemodynamically significant myocarditis. And there are justifiable questions as to what we should do about that, whether that merits stopping the checkpoint inhibitor or not. But for the full-blown, fulminant, if you will, myocarditis incidence still remains less than, than 1%, um, but it is a highly mortal and morbid condition. Um, JAM Oncology relatively recently published a, um, a, an analysis of the FAIRS data looking at adverse event reporting um, and found that there may be a predisposition in women, there may be a predisposition in, in older patients who receive checkpoint inhibitors, but the truth is that at this point in time we really have no way of predicting who is going to develop uh, checkpoint inhibitor myocarditis and, and who will not. So I think if there's a take-home message here, it's that we should maintain a high index of suspicion despite the fact that this is a low-frequency problem and that people who present with symptoms that could be referable to heart trouble, myocarditis, um, should undergo some form of evaluation, and, and a reasonable form of evaluation could include a, an echocardiogram um, and laboratory testing looking for troponin, circulating troponin in the blood, and patients who have suggestive um, echocardiograms or positive troponins should probably take the next step to a cardiac MRI uh, or if you're at a uh, tertiary center that offers endomyocardial biopsy then, then an endomyocardial biopsy simply because this is a, a diagnosis that's important to make. Um, this is my last slide I believe. Um, the question is what do we do about it? So I think one thing is relatively clear. If a patient has um, clinically hemodynamically significant and um, clearly diagnosed by imaging or biopsy, myocarditis, then, then the ICI should be stopped and not resumed. Um, in those cases where people have equivocal results, low positive troponins, negative MRI, no access to biopsy, it's a little bit less clear. I think probably safest to stop it, but, but one would obviously hate to deprive cancer patients of the therapeutic benefit of the drug without more certainty. So I think this is an evolving field and, and I hope that we'll learn more about how to manage the situation. For people who do have uh, clearly diagnosed myocarditis, uh, solumedrol is employed. We have extrapolated from the heart transplant rejection literature to use some other immunosuppressive med medications as well, um, and hemodynamic support with IV anotropes or balloon pumps if needed, uh, but then again, clearly stop the ICI in, in this setting. So, but again, this is a, an evidence-free zone, particularly with respect to the use of immunosuppressives here, hopefully something that we'll, about which we'll learn more in the coming years. So, the last question, um, 
what is the mechanism of checkpoint inhibitor cardiotoxicity? Is it A, hypertension, B, myocardial infarction, C, uncontrolled inflammation, or D, inhibition of cardioprotective kinases? All right, and if you'll take about five more seconds to go ahead and respond to that question. Definitely have the majority in uh, with, with one of the answers. How are they doing? Well, I think this is more, this appears to be more of a reflection of how I did, because D is not the correct answer. If, if uh -oh. the question was, what is the mechanism of kinase inhibitor cardiotoxicity, then uh, D would be a very reasonable answer. Um, Unfortunately, here, as I clearly did not explain sufficiently, the mechanism of checkpoint inhibitor cardiotoxicity is myocarditis, okay. which results from unrestrained uh, T-cell proliferation and, and inflammation. So I'll do better next time. All Happy right. to answer any questions that people have. All right. Well, thank you for that clarification. Let's see. Let's, let's move on to this is our question slide. So just a reminder for for any reason you didn't already uh, join, you can uh, either go to polab.com forward slash UNCCN and type in your questions there or go to uh, the, the, our text 22333 with the letters UNCCN and join in the next questions. So uh, while we're waiting for our audience to share their questions, let me ask, um, in terms of what are, are there things that patients can do to uh, minimize uh, cardiotoxicity, that, and do, do we have evidence for those? And I'm thinking, you know, Dr. Bottiglini has been in and, and done presentations a few times where, where he's talked about some of the tremendous positive impact of exercise during and after treatment. Uh, yeah. Do we do we have any evidence that there are things patients can do with with exercise, with diet, with anything else that may offset cardiotoxicity? Yeah, it's a great question, and, and Claudio's work is is really inspiring. Um, you know, I think for the kinase inhibitor cardiotoxicity and, and anthracycline related cardiotoxicity, I think there's there are pretty clear data that comorbidities do increase risk, and so um, to the extent that one can control comorbidities like high blood pressure, diabetes, mm -hmm. through either medications or exercise, um, not smoking. I think that that does reasonably reduce the risk of, of uh, cardiotoxicity there. Um, for checkpoint inhibitors, less clear. Again, mm -hmm. we just don't understand what predisposes the people who develop myocarditis uh, to that adverse effect and, and what does not. I think the only thing I would suggest is that if there are people who are particularly high risk for cardiac adverse events, um, that to the extent that it seems reasonable without frightening patients, I think asking them to report any concerning symptoms that might be referable to cardiac disease, worsening mm -hmm. shortness of breath, chest mm -hmm. pain, mm -hmm. lower extremity edema, I think that's a reasonable approach. Gotcha. Gotcha. Well, we do have some questions that have come in. Do you want to take that bottom one first? So thoughts yeah. on, on Doxil versus other uh, anthracyclines uh, with cardiotoxicity, would you recommend monitoring uh, echoes? Yeah, so great question. And, and there are, you know, the literature suggests different thresholds for cardiotoxicity with different um, anthracycline agents. Um, I think what is there's certainly a thresholding effect, um, and I think adhering to, to publish thresholds for, for each of those agents is appropriate. You know, it's also true that, that people develop somewhat idiosyncratic cardiotoxicity below the published thresholds. I, I see quite a bit of that in clinic. Um, I think, you know, how we react to that, does that mean that we should do echoes more frequently? Probably not. Um, in people who are particularly high risk, people who start out with low ejection fraction, people who have coronary artery disease, people who have long history of high, uncontrolled high blood pressure, yeah, I think doing an echo halfway through an intended course of treatment is, is probably reasonable. There is a literature on using troponin as a way to uh, initiate therapy in people or to guide treatment, and, and I don't do this personally, but there is a literature out there that suggests that in high-risk patients, if you measure a troponin with each 
treatment cycle that people receive and you identify elevated troponin that you can mitigate downstream risk for them by starting cardioprotective drugs like lisinopril at that point in time. Um, but for people who are at low risk, um, I think that doing routine echoes is, is probably as likely to cause interruption in therapy as anything else. Um, but that it is reasonable for people after they have completed therapy to have uh, echocardiograms down the road. It's particularly true for uh, people who are childhood survivors of cancer. There's a, a big literature on the use of surveillance echocardiograms and testing in uh, survivors of lymphoma in particular. All right. Um, the next question about cardiotoxicity with anthracyclines and Herceptin. Um, so great question about tamoxifen. Uh, the question is, is there any cardiotoxicity associated with estrogen blockers such as tamoxifen and aromatase inhibitors? This is a really interesting area. So um, the studies, there have been a lot of studies in this area, and the findings are as follows, that when you compare tamoxifen with nothing, tamoxifen, and probably has a protective effect against the development of vascular disease, uh, coronary artery disease and stroke. When you compare aromatase inhibitors with nothing, and there are fewer studies in this area, um, there's probably no obvious effect. There, or there is no obvious effect of aromatase inhibitors, either one way or the other, on risk. Mm -hmm. When you compare aromatase inhibitors with tamoxifen, there is a small but statistically significant increased risk of AIs versus tamoxifen. So the way I apply those data is if I want to use estrogen blockers long term in a patient and the patient has a significant history of vascular disease, I usually recommend tamoxifen. If on the other hand they have a significant history of venous thromboembolism, um, DVT or PE, I think a AIs are probably the safer choice. Um, and, oh boy, so what are your recommendations on hypertension or arrhythmia that occurs with a brutinib? And if either occurs, what you, would you recommend switching to a second generation? So this is a great question. And I think the, the hypertension um, probably can be considered similar to hypertension associated with other kinase inhibitors. The data aren't clear, but I would probably use a calcium channel blocker to start with. I would not view hypertension unless it were true hypertensive emergency as a reason to stop ibrutinib or to change agents if, it's, if that's your agent of choice. Atrial fibrillation is more complicated um, because it is not safe to anticoagulate people who are taking ibrutinib. And if there's a patient who should be anticoagulated to mitigate stroke risk in atrial fibrillation, that is to say their chads vasc score is two or higher, um, it is probably the right decision to take them off the abrutinib and look for another agent. That is a complicated situation, and that largely that relates more to the risk of using anticoagulants with abrutinib than it does to the inherent risk of AFib. If you have a patient who develops AFib on abrutinib who has a low chads vas score, that is to say a low risk of stroke, I think you can safely continue the drug because you don't need to anticoagulate those patients anyway. I hope that answers that question. Ibrutinib and AFib is a challenging one, no doubt. All right. Well, thank you. Thanks for the great questions that came in. Uh, we're going to go ahead and, and wrap up. Just a few things left. Uh, we want to thank uh, the North Carolina General Assembly for their generous support of the University Cancer Research Fund. Uh, the UNC Lineberger Comprehensive Cancer Center. We want to thank our team, uh, Mary King, Veneranda Obore, and John Powell for all the hard work that they do for each and every one of our lectures. Uh, they're amazing. Uh, upcoming lectures, working with patients uh, through interpreter services. This is with Miriam uh, Peerboom. And that will be on October 10th. And then a clinical trial update in head and neck cancer with Dr. Chera, and that will be October 23rd. Both of those will be at noon. Uh, we have self-paced courses. Uh, there are a couple of new ones that are on. We typically have 24 of these free online lectures that you can take and receive different types of continuing education credit. Uh, newly added, the many roads of esophageal cancer treatments, side effects, and common complications. Uh, with Dr. Aurora and Kathleen Farrell, 
and uh, also uh, professional development and continuing education for oncology nurses with Claire Gillette. So both of those are now available. Cancer Conversations, these are not uh, for credit. These are for the general public, uh, but we have on September 27th, Does Prostate Cancer Screening Save Lives with Mary Dunn and Living with Breast Cancer uh, with uh, Dr. Gallagher, uh, September 27th for the 1st, October 25th for the 2nd, both at noon. All right. Uh, remember, unccn.org. You can find out pretty much anything about our programs, past, present, or future. Dr. Jensen, thank you so it's much for being here Thanks today. So this has been great. We Thank really you. appreciate it.